Hello, wherever you're tuning in from, this is the Investor's Corner, exploring hidden treasures with me, Tech Steven Ugut. And in this episode, we are glad to be joined in one of the local hospitals here in Juba by none other than Dr. Brian Bailey Berto, uh, an orthopedic and trauma uh, doctor who is uh, currently uh, working in a different hospital that is from Juba Teaching Hospital. He also offers services at uh, Juba uh, Medical Complex as well as in Peace uh, Hospital. He also lectures at uh, the University of Juba School of uh, Medicine. Uh, welcome to the program. Thanks, Al. Today in this episode, uh, as I mentioned, we are glad to be here and talk about the general state of health situation in South Sudan. And it is on this note that I would like to begin our interview by asking you perhaps maybe a vague question uh, to ask you about your own understanding of the state of health sector in South Sudan in general. How would you describe it? Well, uh, healthcare in South Sudan is one of, one of the most fragile uh, in the world. We, we have a lot to catch up with. Uh, we inherited from Sudan uh, a system which is uh, practically non-existent. And that was, that was a good opportunity because uh, that was a chance for us to build uh, to get a head start, like to learn from experiences uh, from different countries in building their healthcare sector. But unfortunately, we did not catch up with time. Uh, and up to the moment, uh, what, what we can say is uh, South Sudan offers basic healthcare services. But when it comes to advanced and specialized uh, healthcare services, it's actually uh, we are still lagging and we still have a lot to, to catch up with. And uh, there, there are a number of concerned stakeholders uh, that are tasked in ensuring that there is a progress in the health sector in general. We have the doctors' union, and there is the transitional, reconstituted uh, transitional national legislative assembly, the committee, the select committee on health, and uh, there are different uh, stakeholders who are playing to make sure that the health sector in the country can improve, considering the fact that uh, the allocation of uh, health budget by the parliament is always a small fraction that is not good enough you know to consider the gap that is created by the forces that you've just mentioned from what we inherited from the old regime in sudan do you think these stakeholders are playing the role that is good enough to ensure that there is a progress that can impact improvement in the health sector yes i think i think so uh, the doctors union mainly uh, has a big role uh, to play because it's the mouthpiece of the doctors and uh, it's actually a way through which uh, doctors can vent uh, their demands uh, to be met. And then probably the, the next level would be at the level of the parliament. Uh, it's, it's good news that we already have a reconstituted uh, national legislative assembly. It has a lot of uh, task to do and perhaps uh, trying, to work sure, trying to work to make sure that healthcare budgets increase, maybe it's down in their priority list, but I think they have a very, very important role to play. Uh, it's, it's, it's not only in South Sudan because like, um, uh, at the moment I think uh, the budget for healthcare is maybe one or two percent of, of, of the national budget. Uh, uh, in a lot of African countries, we do face this problem. And actually, uh, there was uh, a famous meeting in Abuja, uh, the Abuja Declaration where uh, governments in Africa were encouraged to invest at least 10 to 15 percent of their budget towards healthcare. So until we reach that level, I think we still have a long way to go. But uh, any increase in healthcare budget, especially maybe in next year's uh, budget, would be really a, a huge boost for us. And, and, and currently, the state of uh, public health centers, being hospital or, or health facilities, are in a wanting situation. And uh, in itself, the uh, human capacity, the human, uh, uh, the, 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 the number of doctors, uh, the qualified uh, health practitioners is limited uh, currently. Uh, what do you think needs to be done, especially from the public side, from the government side, to ensure that there, there, there should be, uh, I mean, there, there could be enough number of uh, doctors in the field uh, to support uh, the sector and also to reach out to the especially to the grassroots where uh, as, as said by different uh, uh, reports 
that uh, you can find in the whole state or in the whole county, only one doctor is the one catering for the population in those areas. What do you think needs to be done to, to bridge this gap? Yeah, training. Training is a very important aspect of healthcare. And human resources for health, uh, people, uh, a lot of studies were out there that really uh, touch on this issue. Uh, there is, we are lucky because we have three medical schools and the three medical schools produce uh, in the tune of maybe 300 doctors a year. Uh, and uh, the, usually the next step after you produce a medical doctor and they do internship is for you to plan on how to train uh, uh, these doctors towards uh, specialty. Um, it's the cheapest way to do that is to, uh, to, to, to have a domestic uh, medical training uh, program which is not a very difficult thing to do. Uh, it just needs a budget as well as infrastructure. Uh, at the moment, we, we do have a good number of doctors uh, that go out to be trained, especially in Ethiopia, and a lot of doctors go to be trained in, in Sudan as well as some East African, uh, East African countries. And I can say that uh, at least in Juba, we do have uh, a diverse group of specialists, at least for the basic uh, specialties like general surgery, uh, internal medicine, pediatrics, and obstetrics and gynecology. I can say that we do have enough specialists within the country, and if we empower them, uh, we can actually make them, uh, we, can, we can help them establish a training program within the country. And this will ensure that uh, more and more doctors will be trained. And when we train these doctors, we can have the chance to deploy them outside Juba. Because right now, uh, all specialists are actually focused within Juba. Uh, people outside in the States do not have the luxury, do not have access for specialized healthcare. Most of them actually do not have access to, to medical doctors. You know? Most of them actually uh, are managed by uh, maybe clinical officers and these lower categories. So I think if we dedicate ourselves, we can be able to do that. We can be able to train domestic doctors and uh, meet the local demands. Hmm. And what, what do you make of uh, the role of uh, health partners and the donor community in working together with the government in you know, alleviating the health situation and in supporting the health sector in general? What kind of support do you think comes from this institution? I think the most important uh, part uh, these uh, NGOs can play is to coordinate their activities. For example, at the moment we see NGOs coming with certain agendas. Uh, sometimes this leads to duplication of their role. So if we say that uh, uh, part of the NGOs can come and focus on training, training of doctors, training of nurses, and then another one will be able to do a different task, that would be easy. So I think they do have a big role to play. We just need to know how to coordinate these roles so that we can benefit the healthcare system in the country. Yes, uh, I would like to talk about the uh, exchange program and uh, the capacity building that is offered, like you mentioned earlier, by Sudan and Ethiopia. Uh, but maybe before we go into that, let's go for a short break. And when we come back, we'll uh, emphasize more on these details. And it's from this point that we take a short break. Stay tuned. We'll be back shortly. There are plenty of investment opportunities in this world's youngest nation of South Sudan. To better understand the economy and explore the thriving market of this country, you ought to get out of your comfort zone. You either hustle under the scorching sun in Konyo Konyo market, run errands at a small or medium business enterprise, or better yet chair a conglomerate board meeting at a high-end tower in Juba. While awaiting an official business trip to the region, Whatever you do, just don't rest. Work hard, think big, and be smart in order to count all your economic blessings through this weekly business show of The Investor's Corner, exploring hidden treasures. Join us every week at this time. Welcome back. This is The Investor's Corner with me, Tech Stephen Ugut. And in this episode, as I said, I'm joined by Dr. Brian Billy Berto Madison, an orthopedic and trauma doctor who is serving at uh, Juba Teaching Hospital, JMC and Peace Hospital. Welcome back to the program. Uh, before the break, I was asking you about uh, the exchange program and uh, the residence uh, program that is offered 
particularly about the one that is offered by Ethiopian government to South Sudanese health doctors. I understand that so far a number of doctors have benefited from that program. Uh, what do you make of such programs uh, that the government of the two countries are coordinating? I think uh, we cannot be uh, more thankful to Ethiopia. Uh, we are just seeing the products now. I think the first batch left in uh, maybe five, five, six years ago, and it has been constantly receiving South Sudanese uh, medical doctors. and. Uh, from the quality of uh, uh, specialists who come back from Ethiopia, we can see that the training is really, really good. They have a very big population and the doctors do have exposure to, you know, hands-on exposure to many, many uh, types of cases. Uh, it, is, it is a, a, a big uh, a beneficial program that we, we, we really hope that uh, can be expanded in the future so that uh, they take more and more doctors. Um, the biggest challenge at the moment is that uh, the Ethiopian um, uh, the Ethiopian government actually offers the scholarship free of charge. Uh, many, many of the doctors face problems with uh, upkeep. Uh, typically in a training program, uh, a doctor before, before a doctor goes for a training either outside the country or within, they usually get employment uh, to, make sure, uh, to cater for their needs, uh, like they get salaries, and then they're given leave with pay. So when they're in Ethiopia being trained, they actually do have a source of income and that will support them during their training program. Uh, so I think it's a very, it's a huge, it's a big project and we can improve it by ensuring that these doctors actually get a little bit of support when they're there. And uh, this issue of uh, the doctors uh, being trained uh, in Ethiopia, I happen to have an opportunity to go and interact with a number of them. But the main challenge that is facing these doctors is that uh, in, despite the fact that, as you mentioned, the Ethiopian government agreed to give the program tuition free. The commitment that is expected from our side, which was to take care of their accommodation and their, uh, the other needs, uh, it become another challenge. Uh, considering these issues, this, this is, these are minor requirements. Do you think that there is some sort of a laxity from the government to ensure that such programs continue or why exactly are such programs not being fully supported from our side? Yeah, I think, I think we just need to do more. The government needs, needs to do more in, in supporting these uh, doctors out there. Uh, and if you calculate the budget that's needed to do that, I don't think it's, it's expensive for a government because the numbers that go, it's not, it's not that big. And I think everything goes back to the point that uh, we usually uh, don't value uh, how expensive human resources can be. Uh, some of these doctors, for example, if they're training in Ethiopia and they get a chance to go and work outside, They'll be providing uh, actually income to the countries where they, 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 they migrate to. So we just have to uh, realize the importance of uh, the healthcare professionals that we send for training and to make sure that upon return, we make sure that we retain them, try to offer them a good job and uh, make sure that they remain because they will be the ones to develop uh, the country. Uh, but more importantly, I think the issue of salaries, uh, I ho I'm hopeful maybe in the, uh, if the budget of the Ministry of Health is increased, then they can be able to support these doctors who are going for, for, for training. But that's a very, very critical point. Yes, and, and uh, from the economic point of it, uh, to save money and ensure such programs continues, another option would be instead of sending a large number of uh, doctors to be trained in foreign countries, there is another option of bringing maybe few trainers from outside and train a large number of South Sudanese doctors. Has these such op options uh, been uh, ex uh, exploited in the search for improving the capacity of uh, local doctors in South Sudan? Well, um, about 10 years ago, uh, there, was, there was an ambitious program uh, between the UK and, uh, and South Sudan. Uh, uh, specifically, they, they call it the St. Mary's Link where uh, doctors volunteer to come from the UK uh, and spend time uh, in Juba Tenyo Hospital to train uh, local uh, South Sudanese doctors. Uh, that was tried and then uh, I think it did not make it because of a lot of factors, but uh, that can be uh, also a very important uh, strategy uh, because it's actually cheaper uh, to get someone and keep them here. Uh, but the point that most of us are missing is that the same quality of trainers uh, in Ethiopia 
the same caliber is available here and in big numbers. So actually, if we, if, if we take that carry to say we want to establish a training program within uh, and uh, make sure that we support it both, both financially and uh, politically, let me say, uh, we, can be up, we can actually do training within here. And at the moment, there is, there is a lot of effort to establish uh, a training program in pediatrics, yeah, I think affiliated with the University of Juba. And I think that's going to be a success because uh, there are a lot of pediatricians here who are trained outside and uh, wherever they were trained, they were performing very well. So I think that's something that, that's a strategy that we can take to make sure that everything is domesticated. Yes, and is, uh, is there any exchange program that is developed uh, in South Sudan to ensure that regional doctors can come and operate in South Sudan for a specified time and similarly South Sudanese doctors can also be sent to the region to exercise you know and get exposed to such kind of environment and different activities in the region well at the moment uh, at the moment uh, there are no specific exchange programs between uh, South Sudan and uh, not anyone not not one that I know about uh, between South Sudan and other countries but what, what actually is out there is that there are a lot of exchange programs between Africa and uh, countries, for example, Europe. Uh, for example, there is what we call the Medical uh, Training Initiative that gives a chance to South Sudanese doctors to go and work in the uh, in UK uh, in a, in a, in a well-established setting and to get training there. Uh, same thing, uh, also I, I was lucky to benefit from, uh, from a one-year fellowship program in Canada where I went and worked in a Canadian hospital for one whole year uh, trying to learn experience. So these opportunities are there to, you know, uh, to get South Sudanese to work in, in, in these hospitals. But because of the current security situation, it's difficult for, for foreign doctors to come and, and volunteer in South Sudan. I think that that will be something that can be done in the future, some sort of partnerships, especially with Juba Teaching Hospital. But the security situation needs to improve for that to, to, to work. And we all understand the kind of a dire situation that South Sudanese doctors are facing, especially when it comes to employment and uh, the payment of doctors, which is in a very limited uh, salaries and all that. But on top of that, there is a worse situation that has just uh, started, or maybe of recently, the issue of uh, targeted killing of doctors. We have seen a number of local doctors being targeted for no apparent reason, uh, tortured, injured, and even killed. Uh, what do you think causes this kind of uh, atrocities? Again, is doctors who are supposed to be delivering health services to the very vulnerable, and how can they be best tackled? Yeah, I think uh, the two events that happened uh, last year were very unfortunate. It shocked uh, the doctors' fraternity in South Sudan. And uh, really, I cannot delve into the details because I don't know the specifics about the matter. But uh, it's, it, it's, uh, people need to understand that doctors are, uh, you know, uh, they're there for humanity. The things that doctors do... Uh, you know, you cannot, you cannot compare it to anything else. Actually, doctors can work without pay, uh, can work overnight uh, to make sure that their patients survive. And two of these doctors who were actually killed, uh, these are doctors who left the comfort of uh, cities like Juba to go and work uh, in peripheries because these, these are areas where their services are needed. And uh, because of these two events, now doctors are reluctant. To, to go out there and, and, and serve. So I think we need to, we need to work hard on trying to uh, you know, open up, especially uh, the, in, in these areas where, you know, these closed areas where there's no access to the outside world. So whenever someone comes from outside, they think it's, it's a foreigner and this kind of thing. So these are, the, these are the issues that politically probably we need to work on. But uh, we, we just hope that uh, South Sudanese in general understand that uh, the main purpose of the doctor is to alleviate uh, suffering, not, not to take from, from other people. Mm. And, and uh, there's also the issue of uh, government medical leaves, uh, the kind of uh, allowances that come for officials to go and acquire health checks, um, which most of the time happens to be outside our borders is a hefty amount. Uh, what is the best way forward, do you think, as a doctor, uh, in terms of South Sudanese, mostly elites, who seek medical attention outside our country? 
with uh, you know, a huge amount of money that is being approved. Is that the best way or should we invest that kind of amount in our local infrastructure to improve it and you know, deter most of our patients from seeking medical attention beyond our borders? Yeah, well you said it. It's, uh, that's, that's the strategy. I mean, uh, I can give you an example. Um, I do receive uh, referrals. Uh, and some of, I mean, uh, reports of referrals, not referrals, uh, where I see patients who go out and awarded, uh, for example, for a simple patient who had to go out and do a joint replacement surgery, and that patient was awarded close to 100,000 uh, US dollars uh, to travel and, uh, and do the surgery. And when he came, he just came for follow-up. And I, I had a chance to look at the bills, and I was astonished because uh, if you give us uh, a five by seven room and equip it with equipment which are maybe worth uh, 300,000 US dollars, we can be able to do the surgeries here. You know, like three referrals, three referrals can actually equip uh, a center for us to do the surgeries within. There are a lot of examples because we know that uh, sometimes uh, the, the amounts can go to millions and uh, the, the human resources who, are, who, who, who actually do these surgeries, they are available here. We have specialists, we have actually what we call subspecialists. For example, if you do orthopedic surgery, you can be a subspecialist in joint replacement surgery. And we have this caliber here and they are trained outside in very good settings. When they come back here, they don't have the tools that they need to do the, to do the work. So what, what we can, uh, what we can uh, try to encourage is that uh, unnecessary referrals should not be made. Like the example I talked about is more or less a necessary referral. But sometimes patients are referred for, for, for very simple things that can be done actually at Juba Teaching Hospital for, for $50 or less, you know. So these are the kind of things because I think uh, the amount, it's hard currency that we're using. And this hard currency, which is much needed in the country, is being uh, exported outside. And actually, others are benefiting from, from the hard currency that we, we, we earn uh, the hard way. So I think uh, if, we, if we take courage and, uh, and at least, for example, equip Juba Teaching Hospital as a tertiary uh, referral hospital for the whole country, well equipped with all the different disciplines, and if we feel that we don't have uh, the appropriate doctors who can do the surgeries, you can even hire one or two doctors to come and you know, base them in Juba Teaching Hospital and then do everything here. You know? that's, uh, that's an economically sound uh, you know, argument for me. Uh, can you briefly tell us about uh, research programs uh, in South Sudan and the state at which they are conducted, if at all? Well, uh, I, we always like to say that South Sudan is, a, is, is virgin in terms of research. Uh, and uh, especially in the medical field, practically any kind of study uh, done in South Sudan can be published. Because one of the criteria for, for publishing these studies is that nothing else was done that is similar to it. So I think research is a very important uh, field in South Sudan. Um, especially healthcare research. There are a lot of efforts to, to promote research in South Sudan uh, and we have uh, a medical journal which is actually gaining momentum. It's called South Sudan Medical Journal. Uh, it's, uh, it, it issues quarterly and uh, we are seeing a lot of South Sudanese actually publishing in this journal and we are coming up. Uh, there is a new research body called uh, Health and Social Sciences Research Institute South Sudan, which was uh, established and launched. Uh, also, it's bringing uh, researchers from different fields, uh, both healthcare and social sciences, to try to promote research. Uh, people think that research is expensive, but we can uh, actually research can be a source of income for doctors and for even countries. A good example is Makerere University. It's getting a lot of money from research. So this is a field that we can actually uh, exploit, you know, if we try to encourage research, especially, for example, say this uh, from the three universities, uh, making research mandatory for, for, for a medical student to graduate. This is one of the things that we can try to push to establish uh, good research. Hmm. And, and, and uh, as we conclude, 
uh, how do you describe uh, the field of medicine uh, in terms of its economic viability and in terms of sustainability of anybody who wishes to venture into the sector considering the situation of the health sector in South Sudan? What is the potential if it is well developed? Potential is huge. I can say that. Um, as I said, there are a lot of uh, skilled professionals who do not have uh, the facilities uh, they can use to work in. And uh, we, we are seeing at the, in the past maybe one or two years, there are a lot of hospitals coming up. Uh, because people are slowly starting to realize that healthcare actually uh, is, is, is having a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of money in healthcare. So what I can say is uh, for the capitalists out there in this country, uh, you know, invest in healthcare. It's it's just uh, uh, you'll actually reap benefits from uh, the, the economical aspect, but as well, uh, you're also helping the country, making sure that a lot of services uh, can be offered within. So healthcare, I think, it's very expensive. Uh, it's expensive to establish, but it's uh, it's economically viable. Uh, it's very lucrative, let me say. Well, uh, Dr. Brian Billy Berto Madison, the uh, orthopedic and trauma doctor, uh, thank you very much for giving us your time and uh, talking to SSBC through the Investors Corners program. Thank you. Thank you very Please much. Well. And because of COVID, we might not be able to shake hands, but uh, <laughs> thank you very much. It's all right. Thanks. And this uh, brings us to the end of this episode with me. Tech Stephen, good wishing you. Very good time. <laughs>